Greetings and a warm welcome to my community. I am Miles Eversley. Thank you for joining us. In December 2021, she regaled us with memories of a Barbadian Christmas. Immediately after that program, we received several calls asking that she returns to share memories of her community. My community responded affirmatively, as did Eleanor Brathwaite. I'm here today to talk about the neighborhood in which I grew up. The pine housing area back then. I know that there are lots of adverse things that are said about the pine and have been said about the pine, but growing up there, there were some things that stand out in my memory and there were some things that made us into the men and women that we are today. I moved to the Pine when I was just three years old. My parents had lost their house in the Hurricane Jeanette just a month and a few days before I was born. And we moved into the Pine at that time, into what was known as the storm houses. Lots of people were able to get houses in that particular area. And I'm not living there anymore, but I've not moved, I've not left. I still revere the Pine housing area very highly because I have some lasting childhood memories of that place called the Pine. We lived in a place called Avon Lane. And if those of you who know Avon, from way back then, Avon was sweet smelling perfumes. So we lived in Avon Lane and that is located in Golden Rock. And we as children used to feel really proud talking about Avon Lane in Golden Rock, Pine Housing Area. When the name was changed to just the Pine, we were, some of us were sad because we had grown so accustomed to writing the, our address as Pine Housing Area that some of us were sad. So we had some beautiful childhood days. At the time, it was just a district sandwich amongst about three plantations, the Wilde Plantation, the Pine Plantation, and this plantation up where CBC is now located. I don't remember the name, and I know the, the person who would have told me the name now would have been my mother, but she's on to the great beyond. But we had those three plantations, and there was, there was just corn and cane and cane and more cane and green pea trees and potato grounds that surrounded us. And of course, some little cart roads that you had to go through because there weren't a lot of roads that were cut um, and paved as the area is now. But they bring back some beautiful memories. And there was no licensing authority. There was no waterworks. Of course, there was no CBC. There was no banks, berries on the other side. The, the, those, those businesses did not exist at the time. We were accustomed to, lots of us, our parents, when they went to dig potatoes down the long road, what we call, what is now the Pine East West Boulevard used to be the long road, and we would go down the long road and help our parents when they went to dig potatoes or when they went to pick peas. And I remember when the Pine Hill Dairy was built, and I remember when CBC was built, not CBC, Radio Barbados, because at that time, you heard of it as Radio Barbados. This little building, it wasn't all, all these buildings that they are now, this little building. And when the Pine Hill Dairy was built, uh, quite a number of persons in the area got jobs there. And I remember you, you told the time of the day by the horn at the Pine Hill Dairy. It had a loud horn that was heard throughout the entire area at seven o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock in the evening. So you, at five to four in the evening. So you knew the time by that horn. And we also had some, sometimes we used to have a, a very unpleasant smell coming from the Pine Hill Dairy at some points in time, um, which quickly went away. But lots of persons in the area got jobs at the Pine Hill Dairy. Um, they cut down all of our beautiful canes. We used to have some lovely canes, especially with the plantation. We used to have some lovely canes and all out there with the Polytechnic case and the Sanitation Authority where the houses in Wildey, North Wildey Terrace are located. Those used to be beautiful cane grounds with some lovely canes. Of course, we, we, uh, we 
we would go sometimes and break some and have a nice, I used to suck cane at that time, I don't anymore. But um, those, were, those were the days. So this area out here where CBC and Pinehead there and all these places located was just a dark corner that you went around and they had a little thing looking like a little cave right there at the top where you, don't, you join onto the, the highway now and children sometimes children used to hide in that little cavish area and frighten each other when they were passing. All the area behind the old waterworks that was all what we call the mountains. There was the up, the up top mountains and the below mountains and those were shortcuts that we went through to get to school at Pine Primary School. Lots of children in the area went to the Pine Primary School. There was no Wilkie Cumberbatch at that time. And when the Wilkie Cumberbatch School was being built, the, children, the parents were sent letters, the, pine, the parents from the, from the Pine, who had children going to pine, to pine Primary at the time, were sent letters asking them if they wanted their children to go down to Wilkie Cumberbatch. And quite a number of persons accepted it. I remember my parents saying, you ain't, y'all ain't going down there, y'all going to continue up at Pine Primary. And so we didn't go, but a lot of my friends would have gone down to help start up the Wilkie Cumberbatch School. Um, a lot of us remain at Pine Primary. Then there were a few persons, a few children in the area whose parents sent them to Store Primary in Government Hill, where they would walk down the same long road. You had the opportunity to be well educated, and your parents pushed you in. in other, they didn't not as they, not the way it is done now. Your parents made sure you did your homework. They made sure that you went to school. They made sure that you got something to eat, right? They made sure that you were tidy, even if you only had that one uniform and that one pair of socks, you were tidy. So looking back now, and they, 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 you found out people helped each other there in the pine. People helped each other. And especially when it came to children. We had some large families, the Yards and the Hardings and the Morgans and the Carringtons, the Mahons and those, those persons. These are persons who helped to build the foundation of the plane and who helped to make, make it what it was, the, 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 the good aspect of it. We were in an agricultural area so to speak, and our lives were based on agriculture. Everybody had a little kitchen garden, everybody had ducks. We couldn't keep pigs, that was the only thing we couldn't keep in the area because that was prohibited. But uh, we had fowls and we had, some people kept turkeys, but most persons kept fowls and ducks. And we had, um, you had your own little kitchen garden. Everybody came out and they dug their own little kitchen garden. Um, I remember going over to build the plantation with my, my parents to, um, to help dig um, potatoes. And I remember when Banks Bureys was open, my mother raked up a whole bundle of little children in the area and took us all over to the opening. Because at that time, nobody you don't have to have any invitation to go anywhere. You just went. We just heard that Banks was a new, a beauty was opening this fantastic place that was going to sell tiger malls. Yeah, the children were told tiger malls. Yeah, yeah, of course the adults knew it was going to be bare as well, but we were told tiger malls. And I can remember that particular evening drinking my first tiger malt. And we, they, we all had a love for Banks. So they were sometimes they would get away from home and you would go up there and then, you know the fellas would give you a little drink and so on and you would go back home with it. Especially my brothers and the guys around the area. The Pine was an interesting place. There was a time when the, there was a case with the boys, some of the guys from, I think it happened over a football match. There was the case with the, some guys from the Pine and, come, and there, was, there were some wrangling with them and some guys, I think it was from Carrington Village, and it ended up in the court. It was one of those times that we really didn't like or we didn't want to hear. And, and I remember uh, as a young girl hearing my parents and the, the neighbors talking about it when they went to the court, Hope Perry said to them, P for Perry, P for Pine, and P for prison. But nobody went to prison. Uh, persons were given stern warnings and so on. And I think that that made a difference to the 
fellows in the area. And that feud eventually died away. And, but be, be, because we, we were taught to live this real closeness, this close-knit thing, this togetherness, and you had adults who took up children and carried them. If Miss Dunno was going to the races or, or Miss Warrell was going to the races to carry along everybody's child, the, the Admiral would have been a part of that too because he came into the area at some point in time with his family. So he would have been a part of the crowd that would have been taken down to the garrison. Everybody walked to the Pine Gardens and we went to the garrison and came out, have a good, had a good time. We came at home, lots of us would have been taken to the sea. We, we did things in groups. There were large families in the pine, and we had persons like the, the Dunners, the Thompsons, the Browns, the Hardings, the Brathwaites. There were, there were lots of large families in the pine, and they, they're, some of them, they, their children, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are still in the area today. They still maintain that camaraderie among themselves. Um, we, I remember we had one young lady who she grew up, we were back door neighbors, Pamela Dunner, and we grew up together, the Dunner family and my family, we were like sisters and brothers. God rest her in her grave, she died the year before, but Pam did a lot of community work. She carried on the legacy her father left behind. This would have to be in the 60s, I think it was around the 60s. The, you know, the girls in the pine had started to grow up. A lot of them used to go down to work at the Barbados Children's Radio. They were having difficulties with having somebody to keep their children because their parents would still have been working and so on. And I remember my mother, she and Mr. Dunner, who was our backdoor neighbor, Mr. Jarvis, Jarvis Dunner, they they, they felt for these young ladies, these young girls, and they went all out to try to see if they could get their nursery started. So they did things like what was called a jumble sale. You probably may not know what is a jumble sale, but they did these jumble sales on Saturday mornings. They would go down to the market in Fairchild Street, just above where the old bus stand was. They had a whole set of stalls. So you paid some little bit of money, you rented a stall, and you carried clothes and you sold them. At that time, people used to wear what they called hand-me-downs, um, and, and not bother, clothes was not a big thing as they are now in Barbados. So I remember many mornings, <laughs> many Saturday mornings, my mother waking my sister Brenda, I'm like, you're up early. And we had to go down with her and Mr. Dana to help sell these clothes. They would, she and Mr. Dana would walk all through the Pine Gardens and ask the white people for if they had clothes that they needed, they wanted to give away. And they took those clothes and they sold them for over the length of time and the money they put together to start that Dolores Mar World Day Nursery. And it is when they got to a certain a certain level and it was becoming kind of like really difficult to, to, to get, to, to really con continue with it, that the government stepped in and took it over. But the groundwork of that Dolores Mar World Day Nursery was laid by, Mrs. by Dolores Mar World and Mr. Jarvis Dunner. And I had a part in it as a little girl. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I, all I know is we were going down to the market. And I looked forward to going down to this cheap side market. And they have since been rewarded for their, before they died, both of them were rewarded for their, their, um, their work that they have, that have played. Many fine sportsmen and women have come from this community. In fact, you might recall its exploits in the sport of netball. We had a netball team. The, the girls had a netball team, a strong netball team. They used to enter in the Andes would have been towards the 80s, the 70s, 80s. A strong netball team where you had persons like the same here as Lindo, you see Manning, Pamela Hamblin, those girls could play netball. And the Pine had a fantastic netball team. You know, the, you, we, we had persons like Winston Gaflute Richards, who was a singer, a popular entertainer in Barbados, and Neville Simmons, who we refer to as um, Nat King Cole, a little short, Neville Simmons was a little short man, he died a few years ago, but he come up, he grew up right there in Golden Rock as well. So they, 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 we didn't have, we had the Prime Ministers, 
No, we didn't have the Governor General. We have so far, but we had persons who were of stature, persons who did well for themselves and for their community. In the early days, in the point, what we had on that Golden Rock pasture was a clubhouse. This was long before Regent Hill existed or before the community center in Regent Hill existed. We had something called a clubhouse built by, I think the government would have built it. And in that clubhouse, the ladies in the point used to go there and learn to fold napkins. Folding of napkins was a big thing at that time. So our parents, our mothers went there and learned to do that. They, there was a lady called Miss Rose who used to live in Blackmoon Fields. She'd belonged to the Salvation Army. She used to come up some Sundays and kept Sunday school in the clubhouse because they, even though you went to Miss Rose's Sunday school, then you left and you went to St. Barnabas Church, the Sunday school, which most of us would have gone to. Then some children would have gone to the Nazarene Church in Camarot, which was just a little one-door thing, uh, one-door church. And eventually, I think that, got, that was burnt down before the big one was built. But we went to Sunday school in the clubhouse. And also in that clubhouse, most of the women around the area learned to fold napkins. A lot of them went there to learn to do special dishes. There wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a macaroni pie and so on. So they went there to learn, you know, the skills. The, the, the young girls especially who couldn't cook, you went there, you, you got, you got um, coaching in those areas. There was also a cake icing class. I did cake icing when I was 13 years old in that community center. So the boys went, they played the table tennis and so on. It was, I, I, they, they locked it down. It was a good, a good um, clubhouse and a lot of, it catered to a lot, of our, a lot of us. And then eventually they knocked it down when they built the bigger one between Bridget Hill and Parkinson Field, right? But we would have benefited from that particular clubhouse. And when they knocked it down then the field, the entire field then became like a football field for the boys in the area. They, played, they went out and they would kick football out there in the evenings to, until they built the Jarish Dunner or People's Home, which is there now. And this would have, they, all this would have come in in the latter years, like the 80s, early, the, the early 80s or thereabouts. But um, we, had, we had that clubhouse. We also had we knew it growing up as MTW, but it was just the part, not where the workshop is. It was just from that part down to the other end. It, there was no licensing authority thing above it. I recall we used to make my brothers, they went into MTW's yard and they would get the ball bearings from up there and they would make rollers and scooters and whatever. And I remember a day we were outside in the hot sun. It was a long vacation what we call the long vacation, not the summer vacation. Uh, it was long for us, it was a long vacation. Summer was something for the people who lived overseas. And I remember we were outside on Miss Edwards Hill, the hill down at the bottom of our gap. Um, when they called Miss Edwards, we used to call it Miss Edwards Hill. But we were all up there, we were having a wonderful time. Who wasn't on a roll? Who didn't have a roll? I had a lorry. But we were in the sun and it was like one o'clock. We were having a ball and somebody showed Miss Warrell coming. And the whole group of us through Shepton Lane and up through Miss Donna's yard and into our yard by the time my mother got there. The whole clan from Shepton Lane Avon Lane and wherever else get licks. Miss Word be everybody. <laughs> and nobody's parents said anything. That was a different Barbados. Now, not only was this area remembered for Miss World's flogging of the children, it also has its place on the religious landscape of the community. Where the listening authority is now it brings back a lot of memories and the old waterworks because every year for about six weeks, the Adventists set up a tent there. And they would set up their tent soon after the Nazarene church set up theirs on the other side of the road in front of where licensing authority is now. That set of houses there, the Nazarene was set up theirs for maybe like two weeks, two, three weeks. And when they were gone, then the Adventists set up theirs on the other side of the road. And once there was a tent in the area, once it was a service in the area, once it was a church, any kind of church service in the area, we as children, you went to it. 
and it was it was a given and children enjoy that i can still see miss i think her name is esmeralda miss lindo here's the linda's mother i can still see miss lindo i think she has a church in in the um, chapel gap now but i can still see miss lindo beating that tambourine until the balls fall off and she made a she her beating of that tambourine in that tent gave a new meaning for me to the song he brought me out of the Mary Claire. Every time I hear that, I see Miss Lindo. So you went, you were a Nazarite, you were a Nazarite when they were there. When they left and the, and, and the Adventists set up, you became Adventists. But at the end of the week on Sundays, you still went to your respective churches. Some persons in the area would have gone to Bethel, some would have gone to the St. Michael's Cathedral, James Street Methodist Church, but the majority of people in the area would have gone to the St. Barnabas Church and got involved in everything that there was there. I remember people used to come through the neighborhood and, and, and keep what they call meeting. So every now and again you would find somebody with a hat down on the ground and they're preaching and singing and whatever to a loudspeaker. And sometimes the parents were, you were put in, people would put in a penny or a cent or whatever. And there was this man who came almost every Friday night for over a period of time, a white man. And he would come to the top of our gap. And some nights the only persons he would have to preach to would be myself and my sisters and brothers, Miss Barra's children in front, the one like Miss Barta Angela Sheen going back. The same Pam and them, and the same set of children. And every time he had this altar call, we would go up and get saved. I often say I will not go and get saved again <laughs> because I've been oversaved. And you would, some, if my mother gave me the saint this week, she would give me as well the saint next week. And the same thing with the other parents. So you dropped in this saint in the hat. Then we missed the gentleman. And we were coming home in... We, my mother took us, I can't remember where we went, but somewhere we went, we were coming home in Mr. Magoo's van. I, I'll tell you what Mr. Magoo went and finished. We were coming home in Mr. Magoo's van, and when it came up, Bishop Court Hill, there was this little one door church going up. And my mother said, You see that church? That is Evangel Temple. That is the church that the man that is, we all is go and listen to him at the top of the gap. It was Holmes Williams, but we didn't know. We only knew then. And I often say to my friends, my money ain't Horns Williams found in Evangel Temple Foundation, you know. <laughs> my, my mother sent a pennies and whatever. But we went up and we got saved. And he came back every, every Friday night and he kept those meetings. And we enjoyed them because that's the life that we were taught to live. Church, church and school and those little fun activities. That was our life. The evidence is there to show that those many wholesome activities made for a better child and a more community-spirited adult. Now, what about that story of Mr. Magoo? Mr. Magoo was a returning national, and he and a man called Herbie were the first two persons to start what, is now, what has now developed into the ZR and the minibus culture. They had two old vans, and they had some benches built and put on the sides, and one down the center of the van, and they started running the van. What I, I know for certain that Mr. Magoo came from Blackmore Field. So he started running his van in the point and everybody caught on to it because sometimes the bus would be late and everybody started to catch on to it and that's, that was the, to me that was the onset of what is now, what we now have as the minibus and ZR culture. So every time you take a ZR van or minibus, you are in a sense honoring the memory of Mr. Magoo. Speaking about honor, it is important that we pause to honor those individuals in the pine who kept the wheels of commerce spinning. In the, in the pine we had in those days, in the early days, in the 60s, 70s, we had two shops, two major shops. And the Braffitt shop, and Braffitt shop was down Gola Rock, May Road. And Braffitt had, it had two sections, a section at the front for the men, and the section at the other side, at the side, where you went, you got your regular dry goods and so on, and your food and whatever. And that was a very popular shop in Golden Rock. Mr. Braffitt had a lot of children, and they all helped in the shop. And then a little further down, you had Miss Dotting's shop, a more conservative old, um, lady who was 
very, they used to say her things were more expensive, right? But um, these were the people that you went to, you bought your food from. And then there was another one through one of the avenues, I think that was in Smith Road or something, that was Miss Morgan's shop, but that was a smaller one. And then in latter years, Hole in the Wall came along. And Hole in the Wall, after Mr. Braffitt closed down, they moved out, Hole in the Wall came along, and Hole in the Wall then took, the, took over the shop aspect of our, our neighborhood. The Pine community has much to celebrate. Its people have written their names on history's page and many of them continue to play their part in building a better Barbados. Lots of children in the Pine would have done very well because some people seem to think that you came from the housing area. So because you came from the housing area, you weren't going to make anything of yourself. But I can say to you that many of us did extremely well. I know that the Pine at that time producing about four hey, teachers of primary schools. I know two of whom still live in the area. They're retired and they still live in the area. I know they have gazetted officers. And I remember there was, Harry was like the police officer in the neighborhood, Harry Gooding. Harry was the, the person who, who blocked the um, gate at the Empire Theater. When he stretched out his arms at the gate of the Empire Theater, everybody, everybody went backward when they were pushing to get in. Harry was the, the, the somebody in, the, in the, uh, the policeman in the community that you looked up to, you know? So we, you had persons who went on to hold good um, um, positions in government and in various jobs. And when we look back now, when I look back now and I, I study of persons who got on the school bus with me on mornings, who waited at the bus stop with me on mornings, and the things that they would have gone on to do, a lot of them now have retired like I am, and the things that they would have gone on to do, it is truly amazing. You, you, you know, it makes me feel good to know that I came out of a neighborhood. I know that it is not, it doesn't have the best reputation at, at this point in time. Um, among lots of citizens in Barbados, but there's good in the pine and there was good in the pine and I'm sure that there will always be some good in the pine. It is just to know, yes, you may go through and you may hear, you may see these things that happen, these bad things that happen, but there's still some very good persons who live in the pine. And I will sing its praises until I die. The words of a respected lady who grew up in the Pine, spent 41 years in the teaching service and the last 18 as a primary school principal prior to retiring in 2015 as principal of the St. Matthew Primary School. My community salutes Mrs. Eleanor Brathwit and the Pine community. Next week, we take you to the parish of St. Peter. Until then, I am Miles Eversley. Goodbye. Oh, sing my brother.